there is a concept uh, known as the greatest name of Allah, uh, the Ismin Adham, um, which is supposed to be a, a divine name that is so powerful uh, that if you know all of it, um, you could do anything. Uh, it's just that the uber potent divine name is referred to many times in the book. Can people do different things with that? For example, assigning the different, uh, the seven planetary spheres to the seven parts of uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, but also to the, the first of the Quran, the Fatiha in general. And then certain angels and certain jinn and whatnot get associated with those seven portions of it. Welcome to the Spirit Box Podcast, where we explore folklore, magic, the world of the spirits, and everything in between. For episode 89, we will discuss one of the most infamous books ever penned in the Arabic language. Indeed, one of the most infamous books in the history of Islam. Feared, banned and burned, the Son of Knowledge, or Shams al-Marif, has nonetheless survived the vagaries of time to rise to prominence as the most famous Arabic grimoire. To that end, today we are joined by Amina Inlows and J.M. Hamadi to discuss their collaboration in translating the book into English, for the first time I might add, and illustrating the Son of Knowledge, along with a rich commentary for Revelor Press. Amina is an Islamic theologian and academic with a PhD in Islamic studies from the University of Exeter in the UK, with a special interest in esoteric theology and the uncanny. She is the author of Women in Shiism, Ancient Stories, Modern Ideologies, and her translations include Spiritual Mysteries and Ethical Secrets and Exegesis of the Quran. She has also written on the intersection between spirituality and science fiction and fantasy worlds. A gregarious introvert, she is a popular public speaker, has worked as a guide for religious pilgrims, and enjoys a good discussion on traditional spiritual arts and the study of the stars, which you will hear plenty of in the show. Now, J.M. Hamadi is a talismanic artist, a florist, diviner, writer, an educator, and for those of you who will be Picking up a copy of this book, you will find a fantastic illustrator and artist. Currently residing in New York, he specializes in various traditions of image magic, with a focus on astrology, star lore, and talismanic craftsmanship. His work seeks to bridge contemporary aesthetics with time-tested magical techniques rooted in astrological magic. Possessing a keen interest in craft, he is apprenticed in the ways of butchery, the funerary arts, and most recently the art of floristry. To this end, he has also received a BFA in printmaking with a focus on the arts of metal engraving, intaligo, and works emphasizing etching and lime. Now, the son of knowledge. Well, little is known about the author, Ahmad Ibn al Albuni, who died in the 1200s. His name suggests he was born in Buna, now known as the Algerian city of Anaba. In any case, what can be said is that the Son of Knowledge is an authentic reflection of the Arabic esoteric tradition, which has been passed down throughout the ages under the spiritual ages of a great master, and which today is the single most influential and comprehensive work in the Arabic occult tradition. In the show, we discuss the mysteries of the letters, the secrets of Bismillah, and its significance and remarkable significance in Islam. We discuss how the name of Jesus Christ turns up in the book and that how that is reflective of the Middle Eastern world of the day, the different influences of different beliefs as they borrowed and exchanged uh, over history. We talk about talismans, my guilty pleasure that I immediately snuck to the end of the book to read which is a bit naughty, but very, very hard to resist. We discuss the interesting czar practices of East and North Africa, and the mysteries around inspiration and spirits, and the use of tonal sound in practice. It's a wonderful, illuminating show, and it was a real, real pleasure to, to record, and I hope you enjoy it. In the Plus show, the rich conversation continues with topics covering the Ring of Solomon, what it meant what it had mastery over, the Queen of Sheba and her being allegedly half jinn, and indeed we explore the topic of half jinn people a little bit further. We discuss how the Son of Knowledge and the Picatrix sit together, the, the similarities, the distinctions, 
And we discuss in more detail the association between some of the letters and the lunar mansions. And we then further kind of pull that thread a little bit further and, and discuss the lunar mansions with their associated stars and look at it from a, an as astrological perspective. Now, if you'd like to hear the Plus Show and like to support the Spirit Box, there are a few ways you can do so. The easiest way is to join the Patreon or you can buy me a book. You can find out to do how to do both of those in the show notes below. Clicky linky. That's the simplest way. And equally, if you want to skip the show and find out exactly where you can get a copy of The Son of Knowledge, check the show notes below and the links will take you right to where you need to be. Okay, that's it for me. Let's get on with the show. Jay, uh, you're both very welcome to the Spirit Box. It is an absolute pleasure to have you uh, on the show. And to, to get things started, as is uh, tradition, could you tell the audience a little bit about yourselves and um, why you're here today to discuss the Son of Knowledge? Uh, my name is Amina Inlos. Um, I have a doctorate in Islamic studies. Uh, from the University of Exeter, and I do teach Islamic studies as my day job. Uh, why I'm here, I suppose it's because I am the translator of the book, and I think it's an interesting subject. Uh, and overall, I think there's a lot of merit to preserving uh, the val valuable aspects of the pre-modern tradition uh, in today's world. And I think uh, some parts of today's world, uh, especially the heavily one can say heavily secularist materialist uh, spheres uh, are in dire need of something else. So this is part of my attempt to provide a bit of something else. I'm going to give a little background mm -hmm. um, to Amina and my relationship or how it, how it begun. Oh, I'm JM. People just call me Jay Hamedi. Um, I taught a class a few years back on the Arabic lunar mansions from the Shams al Ma'arif. And I was working with a Spanish translation of the text first. I'm half Mexican and um, I go back and forth between Spanish and Arabic um, as my other languages besides English. And uh, Amina took the class and immediately after the class was the first person who reached out to me and said, you know, why, why haven't people translated this into English yet? And it was one of those things of looking at the people who have been trying and, and seeing, um, I guess, perhaps where they, where they fell short or, or just why it happened to stop for a variety of reasons. But we kind of came together and we were talking about it more and more. And she totally took the initiative and was like, no, we're, we're going to do this. I'm going to do this. It's, it's going to happen. And she was adamant about it. And now we're here at this point with the book and it's been released and we're both very excited. And that's sort of how we met and how the book came to be. Um, it seems like it's all happened so quickly now, right at, around the beginning of the pandemic when the class happened. But uh, I, I am an artist, uh, diviner. I actually work as a professional floral designer here in New York City as my day job. Um, I also write and teach classes every now and then. Uh, but I was raised Muslim. My family is Shia. And I've, I've as, along with my studies in astrology, uh, I've come back to this material over the years. Uh, it's very ancestral for me in that way um, but with astrology in particular i've found that getting into the the, the islamic magic or by, by islamic magic i mean magic that uses elements of islam as a religion uh, the surahs of the quran this sort of thing uh, has has helped me come to greater understanding of both my ancestry and things that i find magical Yes, lack of a better way of saying it, but that's in short who I am and how we got here. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you're both welcome, and, and I'm I'm really delighted to have you both. Um, when when I when I first got uh, the message uh, uh, from you, Jay, about um, would you be interested in talking about um, this book? I was like, yeah, <laughs> like, you know, would I ever? Um, and when you sent through the um, the the, the pre read copy, um, it was I was joyously uh, scrolling through. I, I have to say, I, I did. Um, I did immediately skip to the talisman section. It's a bit of a guilty pleasure of, yeah. of, of mine. Uh, flipping through, uh, which uh, there's some wonderful, wonderful stuff in the, in the talisman section. Really interesting. Um, and um, anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, right. So for those who are are, are not familiar with the um, with the book. Um, can you give a, a, a I'm going to open it to, to, to both of you, give a kind of a brief overview of, of the book's history um, and its author, uh, Ahmad Ibn Ali al Buni. Now, I'm constantly <laughs> criticised for my Arabic pronunciation, so I'm very confident with both of you on, on, the, uh, on the call that finally something will be pronounced correctly on, on this show. Uh, so I'm going <laughs> to hand it over to you guys to, to, to talk through. Uh, Shams al-Ma'arif is the most prominent uh, occult or esoteric text in the uh, Arabic language and the Islamic world, uh, which does stretch beyond the Arabic speaking world, of course. Um, There are, of course, uh, many other texts and many other manuscripts. Uh, Many are printed, uh, but many are not uh, printed. They're still available in in handwritten copies. Uh, So this is certainly not the only thing there, um, but it is the most well-known one. Uh, And it acts as several different things. Uh, I'm going to approach it in three ways here. Uh, It is an encyclopedia. It has been compared to uh, Agrippa's uh, encyclopedic work. And I think that's a very fair comparison. And you can see uh, even from this uh, selection, by the way, it's not the quote unquote whole thing. If you want to talk about what is the whole thing, we can talk (laughs) about it later. But it's a good introduction. You you know, as I always say, finish this course of the meal before going on to the next one. It's still got a lot of stuff uh you know for example you can see it's, it's got talismans it's got jinn summoning it has uh some of the history or stories behind the names of the stars and so forth so it's it's got a uh, stuff on different things uh, so someone might consult it just to know something about a particular subject uh, like planetary hours for example or various types uh, of talismans uh, it is of course an instructional text that one might study to learn how to do these things uh, but I've also come to appreciate that it is also an uh, initiatory text or a sort of induction uh, into the metaphysical current of the tradition, uh, if you will. Of course, this is typically done with a teacher, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it does link you uh, into this particular practice and this uh, genre, if you will, of spiritual work, uh, occult work, esoteric work, whatever you wish to call it. Uh, especially if one is focusing on it a lot uh, and with full respect. And you also see that the author, because his voice is present there in the text, he's not a, um, you know, he's clearly not an egotistical person. He's not putting himself forward as I am the great sage or soothsayer or whatever of the era. He's actually quite self-effacing and in many ways just simply allows uh, the tradition and the lineage to flow through him. He credits previous mystics and teachers and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, he does also express a concern for nurturing the student, um, especially spiritually. So there is a sort of relationship with him and with the tradition at large. Uh, one would assume with whatever metaphysical intelligences are surrounding the work as well. Uh, so it does definitely have that aspect as well, which is probably one reason why, despite the fact that I mean, as occult texts go, I, I think it's fairly tame. You know, we're not summoning the daughters of Satan here and Are doing you all sure? sorts of... Um, <laughs> yeah, and anyway, I, I, I mean, there's definitely other stuff out there, which is, uh, how should I put it? It, it, it could be quite disturbing. It, it's not inherently a disturbing text in that way. Uh, but nonetheless... That does give it a certain hit, uh, which I think perhaps is one reason some people are a bit uncomfortable uh, about it. 
And to be honest, I've been actually getting a few uh, emails and so forth uh, from people who are not quite sure whether or not it's the book for them and they want to know, is this something that's going to be useful for me and develop me spiritually? Uh, or is it something that's going to be hair raising and you know frightening? Is it going to bring misery on me and you know evil beings are come, going to come into my house? Yeah, so, so, so there is something to it. Uh, that isn't necessarily there as much with other texts, whether it's because of the author, whether uh, because of the material, because it was used in practice or some other reason. Uh, but in short, um, and there are many other lenses we could take, uh, I'll describe it as an encyclopedia and an instructional work, and also a sort of inductional or, or initiatory right. work. Right. Jay, were you going to add something? Is it <laughs> is it halal or, or not? You know, everyone has to come to that. You know, no one, no one has gotten there yet. Uh, by the way, for the viewers or, or listeners, halal means uh, religiously allowed in Islam and haram means religiously prohibited in Islam. I did get a question the other day, is Goisha haram? Mm. Yes, so, which I guess you start to get these <laughs> questions when you work on this book. Mm. I, uh, Amina is better at explaining terminology than I am. Thank you for, <laughs> for doing that. Um, I... I, I say that jokingly, but I also um, there's a there's a more serious element to it that I do believe a text like this in in musing on the the sun of of knowledge the shams the the sun and what that is and it being obviously an esoteric reference and and anything esoteric being um, t taking on a personal element but the sun as a symbol also representing a kind of selfhood and really the more i ruminate on it the more that i think that this text and and texts like it but this one in particular uh te definitely takes on this element of, of what is your own what is what is your son Right. What is what is the way that in interacting with this animate being that is the text, you can come to express your own son, if you will. And I know that sounds sort of vague and I'm intentionally keeping it vague, but uh, I, I think that there is this very personal element to it as anyone's own personal esoteric spiritual journey would be. And I say, you know, is it halal or and does it work for you? Is it, is it kosher? Is it not? Is something that everyone has to decide in interacting with it themselves. So it, it, at some level, it isn't really on us sure. to decide for anyone else, you know, how they're going to open up to the book um, or if they'll just end up being completely closed off to it, what have right. you. Um, so I, but, and I also think that that's a very fundamental part of what the book is as well. Being a book of practical magic, as you're talking about the talisman section, um, towards the end. And just one more reminder that this is a selected translation. Uh, the, the first thing that people were responding to the book coming out was like, oh, this is great, but where's the rest of it? Who are, are you doing the rest of it? Just like. One one thing at a time. One thing at a time. <laughs> as as Amina said, finish the first the first yeah. course. Yeah, um, I like that. But but besides that, I think that um, it's it, it takes on this it takes on this personal element, and that is actually a very core part of the book itself. And so yes, it has all of these uh, practical magical spells and. And whatnot, and all that stuff is wonderful. But really, um, and typically in the context of a, of a murshid or a teacher within some kind of Sufic organization, but most importantly with a teacher, one would be a, like go through this unraveling process with the book, with your teacher, the the ta'wil or the esoteric interpreting the hermeneutics of the book, let's say, which looks unique for every individual person, right? So this, this book is perhaps one of the most exemplary forms of that in Islamic magic, in uh, Arabic magic, what have you. So it, the book is all these th things encyclopedic as Amina mentioned, because it has all of these elements 
uh, as a part of it, but also very much contains each person's own individual spiritual journey and the potential of what it may be within it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, one, one of the things you, you touched on there um, when, when you were kind of laying out the, the book and, and, and in part kind of what, what it, you know, giving us a hint of what it means to, to, to you both as, as individuals, um, probably in the process and in the process of the translation and process of this project, um, that meaning has probably evolved. Um, one of the, the, the really interesting things that I found in this was the, the, the presence of, of Jesus in it and indeed kind of uh, outlining his, uh, the, the, the methodology and spells that he used to raise the dead really intriguing um to see that in, in a book of islamic magic um you know kind of what what are your what are your what what's what does that say about the book what does it say about the author you know um and i kind of wanted to hand it over to you uh, well jesus is an important figure in islam uh, as is the Virgin Mary, uh, for example, one of the chapters of the Quran is named after the Virgin Mary, and, and certainly both of them are um, among the uh, people who are more developed in the Quran with respect to the narratives about them, because the Quran doesn't really go through very extensive narratives uh, about sacred figures, uh, which is surprising to people who sometimes haven't read it. Uh, but the, the main difference, of course, between uh, most interpretations of Christianity and Islam uh, is Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet, so he was very close to God, but, but he was not actually the son of God, because that would uh, violate the, the sense, you know, sort of the absolute uh, monotheism uh, b belief in Islam, which tends to be quite strict. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, a, a very privileged status, and, you know, it is believed his birth was miraculous, you know, so a virgin birth, an angel, Gabriel came to his mother and you know through some way or another uh, that this miracle occurred uh, and also most muslims believe that jesus wasn't uh, crucified but um, something happened that he was taken up to god and then he'll oh. be returned uh, at the end of the earth uh, so there are some differences and i don't want to uh, get onto the subject too much um, but within the islamic tradition you can find uh, a number of sayings ascribed to jesus which may or may oh. not be uh, in the christian tradition and some of it is in um uh, either folk Christian tradition or, or apo apo apocryphal uh, apocrypha. Um, so it's not all necessarily yeah. in the standard yeah. sources. Yeah. And that one thing that says, of course, uh, is that, uh, that there was a lot of mixing uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, yeah. religiously, yeah. and in particular um, in the Arabian Peninsula, which is the, the origin uh, of Islam geographically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a strong Christian presence, but also some sects that were deemed heretical, that they actually went there to, to avoid persecution. Uh, so, so there was lots of religious blending in the region. Uh, that's from a religious perspective. Of course, from a, um, a, a cult or magical perspective, if you will, traditions tend to layer and, and get passed on as well. I, I mean, you look at something like the PGM, there's material from all sorts of places, different yeah. deities, different approaches and divine names. And, and it's the he same thing with the... He turns up there as well, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you must there, there you go. <laughs> yeah. and, and, I mean, that's... It's actually not a bad comparison, and, and I am I have heard that Stephen Skinner ha has made a similar comparison. But we are talking about material from essentially the same region. It's just yeah. you know yeah, some centuries yeah. later, it, it is heavily Islamicized in that it does uh, involve uh, the Arabic names of God, which are in the Quran, and you know in some cases recitation of the Quran and so forth. Uh, but it's not, it didn't develop in, in a vacuum. And there's certainly Hebrew throughout the book uh, is quite common in the Arab Islamic uh, occult practice to use Hebrew names, it's just somehow more powerful. There, there's other languages that come up. Uh, and so there's, there's this tradition too. And there's also back and forth. I, I think that's important to remember. Some things came say from Jews or Christians and were given to Muslims and Muslims also developed some things and put them back into those traditions. Uh, whether it's, you know, philosophy, uh, the theology even sometimes, or in this case, um, uh, the uh, esoteric and occult arts. Uh, but anyway, um, Jesus is important is in Islam. Um, as a practicing Muslim, you know, this is me, my, my view, yeah. I probably yeah. wouldn't use the phrase Jesus cast a spell to raise the dead just right. because uh, 
the Muslim belief is that uh, the prophets could carry out uh, miracles, and most Muslims or many Muslims right. will believe that yeah. very saintly people, mm -hmm. even if they're not prophets, can somehow perform some sort of miracle or, or miraculous healing or whatever. Right. But they're not called miracles. They say usually karamat, you know, to distinguish it from a, a miracle like from Jesus or Moses or that sort of thing. Yeah, but there's a general belief that if you're very spiritually elevated, you can do um, supernatural things. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the so you know, it would be like, like someone like me would have to cast a spell to raise the dead because I'm not at that spiritual level. I'd have to go yep. another way. Yep. Um, but, but someone like Jesus would do it through the um, through, through just through divine power. Mm. Uh, that said, there is a concept uh, known as the greatest name of Allah, uh, the Ismin Adam, um, which is supposed to be a, a divine name that is so powerful uh, that if you know all of it, um, you could do anything. Uh, it's just that the uber potent divine name It's referred to many times in the book. Um, it's not, it's not in print. It's the greatest divine name. There are some allusions to it in the book. It's this, it's that, but it's not that. Like there's a, a seal in that chapter and it says, this is the divine name seal. That is not the greatest name of Allah. But one gets from the chapter that it's on the level of what Jesus right. might have done to raise the dead. So there's a, a similarity. Mm -hmm. And then there's a number of applications of that seal, which are mentioned afterwards. Um, but that is uh, one of the beliefs, um, you know, and that uh, the prophets or, or at least some of them were in possession of this greatest name. And some mystics and some special people might know bits and pieces of it and then walk on water and so forth. Um, so that's uh, the, uh, the essence of that chapter. And it's, it, there's actually two sections of this particular edition that mentions it, but one much more than the other. Mm -hmm. Thank the, you. The, Sorry, go the ahead. The chapter here. has, yeah, the chapter is a combination of sigils, names, words, this sort of thing. Um, but so it's, it's the the chapter itself in the book is a is a mixture. But I appreciate that Amina brought up kind of theological debate let's mm -hmm. say in islam whether jesus actually was crucified or not this is something that has been perhaps more of a debate than people have realized mm -hmm. and I, I find it interesting that the figure who's associated so much with raising the dead right there's this ambiguity about whether they kind of died or didn't die in the first mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. so the figure the figure uh, himself is is kind of in this ambiguous place between life and death in right. the same way. Um, but I don't think that that's by accident. But yeah, there's been a lot of debate about what actually happened. Even um, many saying that there was a substitution which occurred, which has been likened to certain Gnostic beliefs, right. even. Um, but. I, I don't know. I was I was thinking about this question of Esau or, or Jesus more today, and I was looking over the section in the book as well as thinking about something that Amina said in a previous podcast that we did, talking about uh, Albuni and the time he, he was living in, uh, and we didn't really talk much about Albuni yet. Um, I'm not sure if we will, but the time that he was living in was very much, and I, we we probably should. <laughs> let's let's uh, definitely talk about, it. <laughs> but. Um, the time that he was living in was very much one of uh, societal upheaval. Uh, I mean, I mentioned that it was the changing of the guard, even astrologically speaking, as we're now seeing between these conjunctions and uh, between Jupiter and Saturn switching elements and the signs that they began conjoining in for the next few hundred years. Um, now moving into air signs and in, in, in our current era uh, as well, this is the same new uh, sets of conjunctions that we're seeing. But the time that Albuni was living in was, was marked by these upheavals. And Amina had mentioned that there's a lot of uh, spells, I guess, for lack of a better word, in the Shamps that talk about deposing tyrants, that talk about you know, ridding, ridding one society of tyrannical kings, this kind of thing. Mm. And I, I couldn't help but think about uh, Jesus's or Esau's reputation as, as, as being this radical character, right? Bringing, bringing the sword, kicking over the stands of the money yeah. changers, um, as being this radical figure in, in Judaism and then inaugurating this new religion, right? And um, 
I, I, I can't help but see that as a, a kind of reviving the dead mm -hmm. in, in the sense that, and, and you see this a lot with the figure of Al Khidr or the, the green, the, this mysterious yes. saint in, in the esoteric tradition in Islam, mm -hmm. but this, this sense of revivification right of mm. tradition of of things which have become ossified as if a uh, you know a corpse or a, mm. a skeleton this kind of thing and to to revive the dead is is to do this very thing but this isn't necessarily to be taken literally this can also be taken uh, in the sense of uh, reviving a tradition uh, elements of a religion this this kind of thing mm. and magic where you're bringing in Jesus and, and what he was known to do also partakes of this, mm. I think. And this radical element of him as a, as a prophet in our tradition uh, reminds us of like, sometimes to revive the dead, you got to go uh, knock over a few banks or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like the, 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 the tyrannical structures that begin mm. to emerge in our societies come from this sort of ossification. Right. So to, to, to revive the tradition, to, to bring it back to the to the logos, to the word in this way, sometimes you got to um, F some people up or something like that. <laughs> um, and and then I, I, more in like, a, uh, I guess, a, a syncretic manner, I, I'm also thinking of like this connection to the underworld, which is so much more explicit in, I guess, uh, polytheistic traditions. I'm thinking of Egypt, but this notion of like Fraser's golden bow, the dying and rising God, right? Jesus being the monotheistic element of, of this iteration of polytheism or, or, or deities that people would worship, especially in the Mediterranean, Mesopotamian areas of the world. Um, and yeah, the, the, G, Jesus is a figure who is in touch with the magic of reviving the dead also mm -hmm. functions as like a monotheistic version of that mm -hmm. uh, archetype of that deity in, in other traditions, right? Uh, Osiris and Isis, so on and so forth. So we could think of that magic in that lens as well. Yeah. And as you, as you said, him coming up in the PGM mm. is, is, I think, one more example of that. Yeah. Intriguing. Thank you both. Um, so one thing I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued to get your your view on um, is uh, the, the secrets of Bismillah. Um, I, I say Bismillah um, to to uh, I'm, I, I'm not I'm not Muslim, but I, I still say Bismillah from I guess what my uh, research into it. It's it's become kind of part of my of my own practice, um, particularly around uh, essentially um, blessing areas and and kind of thinking about bed gin potentially being present that kind of thing from my own personal experiences um, that that's start to come into to to my way of interacting with the world and having my my uh, my own boundaries in 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 place um so seeing the secrets of uh, and bismillah is is was very intriguing to me um and that's that's something i would really like you to talk to uh for the listeners oh no i think that's an extremely intriguing hook i say bismillah <laughs> because of my own experiences with the jinn I'm sure everyone wants to hear about that. <laughs> well, I think a lot of my listeners have definitely heard about my experiences with the gin, but um, I, <laughs> I, I'll keep it very quick. Uh, but I, I am, I was a travel photographer for for for, for a time, and um, I went to Delhi to shoot a story, um, based on the work of uh, a, an author called William Dalrymple. He wrote a book called City of Gins about his time in Delhi, and he mentioned a number of sites. In Delhi, where um, he spoke to to uh, Sufis, and um, the Sufi peers, and then they explained to him about the relationship between Delhi and the Jinn, and that it's uh, the, the the fire spirits love the city, and it always kind of resurrects after it's been destroyed, that kind of thing. So I went to all these areas to photograph them, and 
had some experiences that um, I couldn't explain. And very vivid dreams, um, figures turning up in my dreams saying, don't come here. And when I did go there, uh, I recognized the places from my dreams as one of the sites associated with the gin. Um, so uh, I also had catastrophic camera failure. Uh, oh, I'm all, sorry. All kinds of things, yes. Yeah. Uh, right well, before I, I, as there. we know, the, the technological things are, are the first to go when That's we get the to otherworldly yep. beings. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they fried my, <laughs> fried my camera. Mm. Um, <laughs> but essentially, this podcast wouldn't exist um, if I hadn't had those experiences. And so, wow. you know, certainly kind of um, my own research into essentially the, 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 the British and Irish equivalent in terms of yeah. fairies, you know, definitely a lot here. Yeah. Yeah. Very much, very much so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I found the, ex I found basically the analog in Gaelic Irish for, yeah. uh, you know, within, within Arabic for uh, blessings on casting dirty water out of the home. Yeah. Know? To, to you know to tell Jin to to beware this this dirty water is coming Ex almost kind of completely the same but in, in but in Gaelic yeah. yeah yeah I've heard similar things about the use of iron too uh, I think in the Gaelic tradition I mean certainly iron is considered a gin repellent yeah it, yeah one hundred percent they put um they used to put uh, iron tongs or iron scissors over a baby's crib yeah meant uh, the baby being taken um. That kind of thing um yeah our, our horseshoes are over doors you know yeah i, I have one over my door <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know so it, it, it's that's that's what that is people talk about oh the horseshoe is lucky so but why is it particularly yeah. iron you know? yeah and and there it is over the over the over the door you know over the the entrance into the home it's yeah. very much a ward yeah yeah. Well, in the in the Quran, iron, this meteoric iron, is thought to yeah. right come down from the celestial spheres to aid yeah. in yeah. this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But by the way, I should say that this translation completely destroyed my laptop. Okay, not completely destroyed, <laughs> but but it was new, yeah. and within a couple of weeks, it was just yeah. flashing on and off, random blue screen of death. I, I called oh, the tech oh, support. I, I knew they're not going to help. And, yeah. and they did a lot of like checks on it. They're like, you know, we can't find anything wrong with it. And I'm like, I know what's wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it got worse and worse. And I just, you know, won't turn on, won't turn off, et cetera. And yeah. Yeah. I, I guess the, it's an occupational hazard. Yeah. The, 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 the Bismillah um, malware protector software the, the Bismillah yeah. Rahim app yeah you know. yeah anyway i forgot we're supposed to talk about bismillah so uh yes um bismillah rahman rahim is uh, a common phrase but should not be underestimated because sometimes when we see something or, or say something regularly it, it is easy to not give it a lot of weight um uh, the phrase Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim means in the name of God or, or, or Allah, the um, the compassionate, the merciful, uh, two of the divine names or, or 99 names of Allah. Uh, it's also the first uh, line of each chapter of the Holy Quran, except for one. Uh, and it is recited a lot just in Muslim culture, if you will, or practice. I, I mean, it's recommended by the religion, but it's, it's also like a, a cultural or habitual thing. I and mean, people will tend to start things with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Like students sometimes will put it at the top of their exams just, just to be <laughs> safe, you know. Uh, or, you know, to start a podcast, to to start a book. This book starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Most classical yeah. books do, regardless of the topic. Um, anything you do in life. So, so it is very common, eating, uh, you know, and, and daily life sorts of things, as you mentioned. Uh, but it is also in esoteric circles to be considered uh, one of the most powerful prayers, or, or even just bits of it, like the letter ba, for example, just at the beginning of Bismillah, if you have the intention that yeah. it is the ba of Bismillah, it's said to have a lot of esoteric significance uh, and depth. And this is right. discussed a bit in, in part of the book, um, but I think it's one of those experiential things that some people will feel and some people won't, and everything everyone is different. Um, but it's considered to have an enormous uh, amount of power. And as you mentioned, if there is a situation where there are some uh, malevol malevolent uh, entities uh, about, uh, that it might uh, imbue some divine protection. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there's a number of more practical uses uh, for it that are mentioned in the book as well. This is a good time uh, just to mention that there is this 
a dichotomy, if you will, between the spiritual and the practical in this tradition, which I think is worth reflecting on. Uh, overwhelmingly, many of these applications are for daily needs. Um, like unseating those warlords. And incidentally, the, the, it is in this volume. Some of the harsher ones are actually coming a bit later. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a fair amount of that here. Or if you know, someone needs to, to earn their daily bread, you know, they've got a, a toothache, uh, muscle spasms, or whatever. There's all sorts of practical things, scorpion bites, etc. And yet the act of carrying out these uh, workings, if you will, um, ideally, uh, would spiritually elevate and develop the person. I was thinking about this when Jay was talking about the sun, the personal sun, um, because it is said, and it's not said in the book, but it's said by people who do this sort of thing, that you do need to have a certain spiritual strength or power, um, rohaniya of the person, to be able to carry out uh, this work effectively, you know, whether it's making some of these items or the jinn summoning and so forth. Uh, and one of the ways that is developed is through um, either acts of worship or uh, integrating aspects of the divine, such as the divine names into yourself. Uh, and so if someone is reciting Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim because um, they need protection or they want help in fishing, it's uh, applied to fishing, for example, in this uh, section, um, that there are ways to do that, but the you know the act of reciting Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim would also strengthen one's uh, radiance, if you will, what one's sun-like glow, uh, and, and ideally that would stay. And of course, if someone is really really serious about um, <coughs> um, aligning with the expression, uh, one could recite it in a you know, a specified or, or controlled manner over a certain number of days, a certain number of times. Yeah, in, in a ritual manner uh, and with a certain uh, respect and reverence, which of course you're going to put there anyway. But I mean, to, to do it in a very focused way, which um, you can do for various names or, or recitations and texts and so forth as well, then ideally that would strengthen it. Um, but Bismillah, of course, has um, you know, has a lot of uses. It, it has a lot of depth. Uh, among the things that you sometimes see people doing with it is writing it a number of times and dissolving it in water. So, you know, so you're writing with a water soluble ink like saffron, for example, and then washing yourself. And that's also supposed to, to brighten the person up spiritually. Uh, or someone might use it in spiritual healing, uh, for, for example. So th there's many ways that this phrase comes out in things which are practical or semi-practical. You know, practically spiritual at any rate, yeah. but it is also something that is considered to be protection from evil and just a good way to start things. You know, and I'm speaking a bit more from the esoteric side, from the more uh, conventional side, if you will, pe the type of people who probably wouldn't be interested in this book, <coughs> or I should say specifically the type of Muslims who wouldn't be interested in this book. It, it is still treated as a protection from Satan in some everyday activities. I mean, there's some Islamic texts that say, for example, if you're going to... Um, Okay, well, I saw something written uh, once, and you know, I, I think it's a sort of an example story, not a literal story to be taken literally. Uh, but someone was asking, uh, "Where does Satan live?" Uh, and the reply was, "Satan lives in your house unless you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim." And does Satan eat? Yes, he eats your food unless you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the idea is, it is a, a sort of ward uh, against evil, um, but it is also much more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that that omnipresent element. Like it is unless it's it's it is present, right? Unless mm -hmm. we're reminded um, that the air the air is expressing the name of God mm -hmm. in that way. Uh, Amina mentioned that it begins the Quran, which is important, and it takes on these similar qualities to the first surah of the Quran, uh, Al Fatiha. Um, and also being able to be broken down into these seven parts, which is, is very symbolic and people do different things with that. For example, assigning the different, uh, the seven planetary spheres to the seven parts of uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, but also to the, the first surah of the Quran of Fatiha in general. And then certain angels and certain jinn and whatnot get associated with those seven portions of it. So it can be broken down in these different ways and is important because it begins. And um, I mean, I also mentioned the letter Ba, which has, has a little dot underneath the bottom of it. And there's been 
there's this esoteric notion of all things emerging from the little dot underneath the letter ba, which I'd like to come back to maybe if we talk more about the letters. It, yeah, let's let's move into the letters then. Let's move into okay. the letters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess just, uh, I, I, I sort of see that, that little dot that I just mentioned, um, and then the letters which emerge from that little dot as the kind of, uh, the, the pixels of reality, if you will, almost like this, um, there's a philosopher Democritus who saw everything as atomic or made up of little right. atoms in this way. Um, I'm not saying that that's the version of reality that I subscribe to necessarily, but I see this notion of the little dot under the letter Bez, like all things being able to emerge from the same atomic structure. And when we think about what comes from this little dot, we, we think about a, a line emerging from it. And this notion, which I speak a little bit about in the introduction from um, Halaj's Mansur al Halaj's uh, Tawasin of uh, the dot being the beginning point, which then the line emerges from, and you get things like Arabic calligraphy, right? This flowing line, the, the, the khat and the khayt, the lines and the threads. And these threads begin to form together to kind of weave this giant sweater that is the cosmos, right? And so in learning about this. Uh, learning about the theology, learning about the philosophy, learning about the magic, we are learning about the structure of this cosmos, this giant sweater, and the ways to pull on those little threads, the ways to pull on those little chat heights, uh, the lines, and then the lines which emerge from the dots. And in being able to do this, you not only learn more about yourself, you learn more about um, Allah, you learn more about God, and you also learn more about magic, because if you understand the structure of the cosmos, you know what little threads to pull to create certain changes, just once again, as if you were sewing something or, or creating something out of thread. So I, I see that as the background to all of this, and really one of the, also the fundamental parts, the text being more than just a book of magic, but also containing this cosmology in it. Um, which is both Islamic, but also so much more than that as well. And, and the Bismillah, it, it, it's one example, and, and even the letter Ba at the beginning of Bismillah is just one example of how all of this that I'm talking about, this, this whole sweater is contained in the dot at the bottom of the first letter of the first surah, of the first word of the Quran, if, if, if you get what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. here. So the, the, in this holographic way, all is contained one. Yeah. in the one, or the multiplicity is contained in the unity. Mm -hmm. um, at, at more of like a day-to-day -day level, thinking about the magic of the Bismillah, but also we can transition more into letter stuff from here, because that's extremely important. Um, in reading uh, about czar traditions throughout North Africa, Ethiopia, the Middle East. Uh, it's, it's sort of a passion of mine. Um, if, if you're not familiar with czar, czar is a, a essentially kind of spiritism wherein mostly women interact with jinn through music, through food, through dancing, and through ritualistic possession. Um, but most of these cultures have an Islamic overlay, at least, if not people uh, being uh, very, very, very pious individuals. Um, but most of them are Muslim. And uh, in, in reading the different material on Zod, it, it's often said that invoking the name of Allah or, you know, using something like the Bismillah, the, the Zod uh, or the Jinn will flee at hearing the name here. So if one is about to do a sacrifice in this tradition, in this tradition to invoke the name of God or to use something like Bismillah rahman rahim would uh, nullify the magic in some sense. So uh, not only the name of God, but Bismillah in particular is related to the, the fleeing and the protection from uh, jinn, in particular malevolent spirits, as Amina mentioned. And there's, you, you see this in the text, in particular with fire, which is a reference to being protected from actual fire. Like if you're wearing a talisman with the bismillah on it, that you're going to be protected from, you know, 
like a, a, a candle going awry in the home, this sort of thing, but also from the fires of hell. And let us not forget the jinn are, are composed, at least uh, in the Quran, from nar, from, from fire, smokeless fire in particular. Yeah. So uh, there, there's so much to the Bismillah once again, because it's the, it's the unity that contains the multiplicity. So in this esoteric way, you can kind of go on and on with it pretty much endlessly. But there's a lot of uh, practical uses in the text, um, a lot of it focusing, once again, on protection from, from jinn, from malevolent spirits. You see it also coming up again in like commanding those same spirits or getting them in line. So it's not necessarily just for having them flee, but also like keeping things in order, keeping things in line. And Allah has its connection to... Uh, Al-Arsh, the throne, which is the, the, the stability, right? The four legs, each one marked by its own archangel. So even in invoking the name of God, you're invoking stability, right? So uh, order to things. That's, it, it, it's a lot. <laughs> it's Beautiful definitely report. a lot. But Beautiful report. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm reminded more, of, more on the letters now. Yeah, sure. I, I'm reminded a bit with what you said about Bismida, for example, people might use it to ward off jinn or, or to to summon and attract jinn, uh, specific ones that they want to be there for a purpose. It reminds me of Surah al Jinn or the chapter on the jinn in the Quran, mm -hmm. which some people will recite it for protection uh, against jinn as well as the other uh, four surahs known as the four quls, uh, the ones that start with qul or say. Um, but also some people will recite it uh, extensively uh, many times in one sitting also to try to attract jinn. So it, it goes both ways. Exactly. You know about the czar thing, one of the things that crossed my mind there, uh, and maybe um, Dara might have some thoughts on this too, is it has come to my attention over the years, and I'm a bit late to the party on this, I, I regret, but I have finally noticed that it's not just in context, contexts like that where people who are heavily engaged in music or dance are having uh, contact uh, with the spirit world through that. I, I mean, that's a very intentional sort of thing. Someone is doing it for the purpose of bringing a spirit into them or you know, ha having some of direct experience. And especially North Africa has a lot of songs that, that are used for jinn summoning. Uh, but I have found people in the quote unquote secular world who, if you talk to them, if they're a professional dancer or musician, they, they will say that sometimes they've had these experiences that you know, after a while, if, if they've been performing for a long time, practicing a long time, you know, they, they, they will see something or sense something. I'm not saying everyone, um, but, but I found it interesting that it is there. It's just not usually discussed because people will think you have a mental problem or something yeah. if you say that. I have a, I have a Llewellyn book called, I forget the author. It's on my bookshelf here, but I don't want to get up and check. But it's called Trance Dancing with the Jinn. Mm -hmm. It's a Llewellyn book. And you open it up and there's various yoga positions. And, and it's a little bit new agey, I think. Yeah. But um, it's... It, it's exactly what you're talking about, where people who are, are dancers who have a physical practice in this way, oftentimes, yes, absolutely find themselves um, uh, in, in both encountering and even being uh, mildly possessed by a variety of things. I think, I think the ritual component better uh, helps people kind of uh, discern what those things are yeah. right like what comes through and what doesn't it whereas if you're just like exactly ex exactly that's why i'm like pretty reticent on just a book of like yeah. oh dance start dancing just open the door the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah well um to, to coin a phrase genius is indistinguishable from madness yeah mm -hmm. mm, majnoon yeah yeah um, the, the the music thing is 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 prevalent in um what you could broadly call uh, fairy seership um, in, in European traditions. So certainly within um, within Ireland, the idea of um, pipers, particularly so, uh, Ilan pipers. Uh, it's quite a specific type of bagpipe. It's not it, the air doesn't come from the lungs. It comes from uh, from the elbow movement uh, to fill the uh, fill the the, the bladder, um, but pipers would claim that their the, the 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 tune the air the music 
would have come from a fairy interaction would have come from mm -hmm. taken to fairyland they heard the music they came back they played it or they would have fallen wow. asleep in an area associated with the fairies and they would have heard the music and come back and play yeah. it. um and they would or sometimes they'd attribute their heritage to being semi fairy um but music would be particularly associated uh with um with inspiration from fairy which obviously is the same from gin inspiration in poetry that kind of thing um, exactly but, but this is this is a pan-european thing so like on in mm. the balkans um where there is a living tradition within the vash people of, of fairy seership they sing down their sisters so the the, mm. the ladies who have these experiences they're called m um, in, in the rough translation in english is like those who fall um because they essentially they have a, a they collapse into a trance and then this mm. relationship starts um but they use this a, a song to sing down their sisters and then they start a dialogue and this happens like three or four times a year on specific kind of orthodox christian days um but it's but it's music based and the piper thing is there as well um it's there seems to be kind of this particular instrument seems to yeah. have this um mythos and, Piper. <laughs> and paranormal experiences around it yeah well maybe it's due to the connection between the breath and the soul and the mystical yeah. experience you know because it is a wind instrument yeah, yeah it does seem that these things are, are largely cross-cultural but whether that's because they were shared by human beings a very long time ago or, or traveled across cultures or people just simply think they work or, or some other reason you know, yeah there could be any number yeah. of reason i mean i think one of the things that isn't always put into words about sufi practice uh, is that it is to some degree, you, you have a lot of the same mechanisms going on. Like when people sit there and rhythmically recite the names of Allah or you're playing a drum also, you know, just very rhythmically. I, 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 of course, it's an act of worship, but part of the intent is to trigger a spiritual vision by putting a person into, into a trance. And certainly people who go to these gatherings uh, see all sorts of things. Mm. And just to some degree, I, I mean, I don't want to get into heresy zone here, but the metaphysical machinery for summoning jinn is not overly difficult uh, from what happens in some Sufi and Shi'i ceremonies, except the goal in those ceremonies is to summon the presence of the Prophet Muhammad or, or other saints or family members of the Prophet Muhammad and, and the divine presence. But people actually do a, a lot of the same things, you know, very emotional recitations, as you mentioned. I mean, I'm not going to call them songs because you're not supposed to call them songs, but yeah. tonal recitations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, drums are used both by, by Shi'i and Sufis. Uh, and so there is, you know, it's still a very invocational thing. It's just the the goal of what you're invoking yep. is, is slightly different, you know, yep. whereas in Zara or, or Jin summoning when this is being done, it's specifically to bring in a certain spirit. Mm. So, so I do think mm. this stuff goes, goes probably fairly far back in human history. And it, it's just yeah. been sort of repurposed, um, you know, in different ways. But I find at least the essence is, uh, is still there. I mean, you know, it's, I, it's I, most likely the most ancient form of spirit contact mm. there is, I, I think, and, and definitely cross-cultural for, for yeah. sure. Um, it's even, you're talking about, you're not, it's not, you're not supposed to call it song. And mm. there's this tenuous relationship even with music, especially in more conservative circles of Islam. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I've even had people tell me time and time again, that the, you know, the call to prayer of the Muazzin, this, mm. um, the, the recitation of the Quran, which is also not really music or it's not thought of as music but it sort of is <laughs> yeah and, and and it stirs up similar emotions in people that uh, music does and so i mean it's it's also what you call it but fundamentally it's it's what it evokes in people right yeah. that's what it really comes down to and like i think that or i'm i'm oftentimes reminding people one of my favorite um, what one of my favorite uh, references that I that I come across time and time again in Zar is this notion of the song as the hut or, or the line or the thread. To sing a song is to is to do a thread. And right. as I was talking about this sweater of the cosmos, right? To like <laughs> yeah. to, to sing one of these songs to one of these spirits is to pull on one of those thread, and yeah. that is literally how they refer to the song. And I think I was teaching a class, and someone was. Uh, bringing up uh, Australian Aboriginal, the song lines, these lines of flight mm -hmm. that um, 
invoke the spirits of the land in this way. And I just think this is absolutely um, universal, yeah, frankly. That's, that's yeah. Really interesting. So I've, I've thought about this a lot, you know, kind of like um, ha- where the similarities come from. And like like we said at the, at the top of the show about, about Bismillah, you know, and finding the analogue in, in, in Irish Gaelic, you know, um, for the same purpose as we, we well, purposes uh, as, 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 as we discussed. Um, and I thought about this a lot and I said, well, is this part of, of again, the region it's come from, you know, the, 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 the religion, uh, the exportation of ideas out from this area in, in, in the world? Um, but then you have very similar ideas in, in in areas of the world that have had no contact with with, uh, with Abrahamic religions. So uh, I think I think you're onto something with that, Jay. I think there is a universality in it. Incidentally, um, lurching to another subject, um, I spent some, I spent some time with, with um, Rufai Sufis in in um, in, in um, Kosovo, and the. The sound of the of the zikr, I I will never forget it. It was just mm. incredible. What and and I you cannot help but feel the presence of the divine. Yeah. You know, it's in, incredible. And um, zikr is about remembrance, right? Mm. The, the 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 great recollection of of the unity of mm. the the unity of being. In, in that mystical way. So it's, I think it's no wonder that we're talking about these things as being pretty universal, pretty yeah. darn cross-cultural, yeah. right? Because it's about mm. just that. <laughs> these songs and, and these kinds of things are about reminding us mm. of that very thing. Um, I'm really enjoying talking to you too. It's wonderful. Um, um, I must say the, the illustrations are wonderful. Uh, Jay, they're, they're they're very lovely. Um, Thank you. You rendered um, in in the book, and I, I think you, you you both have done a superb job. It's it's fantastic. Um, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful read, um, and one that I, I know I'm going to come back to. Um, so hugely, hugely interesting, and um, yeah, I, the commentary is great as well. Great oh, commentary. thank you very much. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you enjoyed it. No, thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask for listeners, um, when and where, if they want to pick up a copy, how do they do so? Uh, what's the best way of doing that? Um, the, the publisher, jungle, Amazon, yeah. and the pub- yeah, they're they're okay. not. Uh, Revelor is not shipping to the UK mm-hmm. at the moment. I, I don't remember if they're shipping internationally, but the publisher is Revelor Press. They're mm-hmm. definitely shipping in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are in the U.K. or elsewhere outside of the United States, I think your best bet's probably Amazon, uh, also yeah. Barnes and Nobles. Yeah, just yeah, you're to in be the UK. clear, because some people have been concerned in emailing me, how do I get it if I don't live in the United States? Uh, Amazon is distributing it, distributing it internationally. If you do have a country which, for whatever reason, has not um, chosen to list it on their Amazon site or, or it hasn't been listed, um, you can still buy, say, from Amazon.co.uk and just put your shipping address and, and it should be there. And if you're still having problems, uh, let me know or let Jay know, let one of us know, let the publisher know, and we can do our best to try to sort it out. Well, I'll I'll aggregate all the relevant links and uh, we'll put them in the show notes for everybody, so it's easy. A, a single Thank click, you. we should be able to, to uh, <laughs> yeah. get get everything sorted. You um, spoil us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just thinking about um, uh, Shiva and um, uh, some of the conversations we've been having about kind of the, the presence of of kind of other deities and religions in, in 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 different pieces i found out recently um to to my amusement that the the christian song um lord of the dance is part inspired by the the nataraja of uh, of shiva mm-hmm. that the 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 composer or the oh wow the, wrote the song had a nataraja of of shiva dancing on his desk wow so it's actually in part about shiva <laughs> you know so uh so it was quite interesting yeah, well, there are so many cultural crossovers that we don't always acknowledge, yeah. whether they're ancient yeah. or modern. It still happens like it happened in the past. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you both. I really appreciate it. Um, 
it's it's such an area of interest for me but i'm 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 very um ill-informed and so i i was i really enjoyed talking to you and and, and learning so thank you so much it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show thank you <laughs> likewise it was a pleasure big pleasure <laughs> Fantastic stuff, fantastic. So I hope you all enjoyed that. Huge thanks to Amina and Jay for their time. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it was it was really great to talk to you both. Okay, that's it from me. Thanks very much for listening. I'm Dara Mason, and you've been listening to The Spirit Box. Take care and talk soon. Bye. <laughs>